I think radiation uh, therapy has one of the worst reputations in the entire universe of medicine. And, um, and the reality is, is changing, but it's changing slowly. As, uh, as Niels Bohr says, progress occurs funeral by funeral. And so it's not like there's suddenly an epiphany and you're going to see the world of radiation change. But I'll show you how it is changing to some extent. I want to remind you that I am a neurosurgeon. And uh, if a, a point of historical note is that I would argue that the three most important forces in the field of radiotherapy over the last generation or two have been all neurosurgeons, kind of ironically or interestingly, says something about our specialty, says something about radiotherapy. Are there any radiotherapists here, radio, radiation oncologists? Okay, so good, I can speak freely. <laughs> um, and I assume this is my, uh, okay. So I come from Stanford, where you have sunshine many times, but um, you gotta declare your conflicts of interest. Those of you who know me realize that I'm the most conflicted individual in this room. And I'm fond of saying, if uh, you have no conflicts, I have no interest. Uh, because we all have conflicts, and I think it's, uh, let's get them on the table, and you find interesting people who've done interesting work tend to have conflicts. So um, I'm going to start with this guy's picture, and it's, uh, although it's a benign tumor, I, I think it's important in a, in a meeting that's showcasing advanced surgery to remind th ourselves that uh, uh, great technical accomplishments at their heart have a, have a patient. And patients oftentimes have very different impressions of our great accomplishments than we do. Um, this guy named Mike Murray, who came to me a long time ago, almost 20 years ago, 15, 16 years ago. And um, he had a disease called von Hippel-Lindau disease, multiple hemangioblastoma is a genetic disease, god awful disease that you get tumors in the uh, central nervous system, hemangioblastoma is you know, the cerebellum, even the supracerebellar uh, cortex, even the uh, spinal cord, eyes, kidneys, kind of a bad actor. And um, by age 10 or 12, he was blind. Um, by the time he came to see me, he had had 40 operations, uh, many craniotomies. Uh, it was anephric, had both kidneys removed for renal cell cancer, um, and uh, presented with these tumors there. And he said, Adler, you made this cyber knife thing. And he said, uh, um, I know you've never treated a tumor of the spinal cord. And we had never done anything at this point like that, or any treated tumor of the spine. And he said, um, you will treat me with this or I will die. And I said, well, you can have surgery. He said, no, 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 you will treat me with this or I'll die. And I said, well, make matters, it's easy. I don't have a technology to do that. He says, well, how much will it cost? And it turns out that he was heir to the Wilson's for, uh, sports fortune and so had a you know, big checkbook and wrote a check for many hundreds of thousand dollars. I modified my technology and uh, over the course of a year and treated his tumors, he had a, a good radiographic response. He was happy. We all felt like heroes. And then... Uh, Two years, um, and then went out and he went drive his Ferrari. This guy liked to have, he had one of the most beautiful, his, his girlfriend was the most beautiful woman I've ever met. Never knew how a, a blind guy could have such a beautiful girlfriend, but somehow feeling her, he had a beautiful girl. And he had a Ferrari, and he liked to go out and they'd go to a big parking lot and live in New Jersey, near Princeton, New Jersey. And he would, his girlfriend would tell him how to drive his Ferrari on the parking lot. I can't see shit. But, <laughs> but anyway, this guy was living life good, living life well. And three times a week, he needed to kind of get dialyzed, but life was good. So about two years after we treated this, his dialysis shunt clotted off and uh, required surgery to fix his dialysis shunt. And true to his word, he refused to have any more surgery, and he died. And my, my point here is that dialysis shunt, that's no big case. That's nothing. That's a nothing. But as a surgeon myself, I can tell you, over the years, I've realized every operation I do on a patient, even some modest operations, seem to whittle away a little bit of a, the humanity of each and every patient. So it's always good to remind ourselves, yes, we can do these great technical tour de forces. And when they do transform people's life, that's a great thing. But we should also sometimes temper that enthusiasm for dramatic operations with the practical realities of what it means for patients. And that is the virtue of radio surgery. It, really does obviate um, you know, kind of a lot of the suffering that goes on with big operations. It's not as dramatic, it's not as cool, I don't have cool pro sections. It's kind of humble in some ways. Now it's poorly paid, you know, I'm like I'm the poor stepchild. But I think it's an important tool that everybody doing spine surgery, spinal oncology needs to be aware of. 
So, you know, nowadays we're wonderful technologies that are able to target very accurately. This is some of the technology I helped to develop about 15 years ago that chops the image of an image, uh, chops the image of a spine into small little sub images and, and can target and overlay those sub images. And so we can target in the spine now with almost the same precision we can in the brain for radio surgery, and which is really sub millimetric. So we can, with incredible accuracy, know where we are. And this has been replicated with multiple technologies and multiple systems. And it's, it, this is good stuff in terms of just sheer accuracy. In addition, now we have different delivery systems. You know, I'm a CyberKnife guy. You know, that was kind of where I made my mark. But, you know, you have variant products that do much the same thing. And it's the ability to concentrate the radiation inside the target of interest by shooting it from as many different angles as possible. And it is that solid angle, it's the degrees of crossfire that enable the concentration of the radiation in the lesion and doesn't hit, destroy a lot of normal tissue. And that's why historically radiotherapy was all about bathing large regions of normal anatomy in radiation and taking advantage of the differential effects of that radiation. And, and that was really kind of a, a framework of radiation therapy thinking, it goes back to Marie Curie. And the reality is that doesn't really work. I mean, radiotherapists deluded themselves, the radiation oncologists deluded themselves for like generations to think these four R's explain the way radiation works. Yeah, if you have a lymphoma, it works pretty well, maybe a seminoma, but for the vast majority of solid tumors which have a very different biology than Hodgkin's disease, it doesn't work that well. But they deluded themselves into believing it, but fortunately, about 10, 15 years ago came radio surgery, and we've re-explored the radiobiology of these tumors and realized that rather than bathing, bathing tissue in radiation over four to six weeks, just hit the tumor hard. And it really was that surgical mentality that has really enabled such an, I think, significant advancement in tumor oncology. Um, so now there's, there, none of, there should be a little video playing, but anyway, this video would show you how we can exquisitely target radiation to conform to the, to the tumor of interest. I mean, this little video would, if it was playing, would show you how we can sculpt a picture, an image of David, you know, in radiation. Or the, Michelangelo's David, you know, that great painting of Mike, okay, no, whatever. So, but the point is that we can literally paint pictures with radiation. And it's and that's was unimaginable, you know, 30 years ago. And again, that core technology was called IMRT. was developed by a neurosurgeon named Mark Carroll. So, um, after my, Mike Murray came by, this guy came to me, and this is all you see back 1999, and um, he was uh, another rich guy here from the Northwest. Uh, he had a, a mutual big mutual fund, Crab Houston mutual funds, here. and. Um, he had a lung cancer and had a, a solitary primary that went to uh, his uh, L1 vertebral metastasis and um, had just intractable, went through a course of radiotherapy, it was intractable pain. We didn't have big surgery in those days and he was just on a morphine pump waiting to die. And all he wanted to do is get out of bed and really just kind of enjoy what little life he had left. And so never having even thought about treating some of these cases, we, we just took a pot shot. Could we fix Dick Hewson or not? And we treated him, as you see there, as the, the dosimetry is, is dreadful when I think about it, but treat him one day, one afternoon, with a dose we pull out of our proverbial butts, and, uh, and two weeks later, this guy was playing golf in Hawaii. And, you know, is that a miracle? Well, today it's commonplace. And it's really what is possible with modern radio surgery techniques. And it's only gotten better. Now there's gonna be lots of circumstances where nothing that I describe here is applicable, but we find more and more to the tune of 100 cases a year at Stanford, we now do radio surgery to the spine. Most, most of the vast majority are, are malignancies, metastatic malignancies, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, as I'm sure you do a lot of cases here. But radio surgery has to be one of the fundamental pillars of a modern spine oncology program. Um, you know, there are lots of circumstances where all of the therapies are failed or just kind of next to impossible to do. 
and where you, radio surgery really can kind of save, you know, pull one's ass in the fire. And here's a, a woman from the North kind of like Mendocino who had this solitary leiomyosarcoma. Uh, metastasis, uh, went through stand, full course of standard radiotherapy. Again, I want to showcase, she had a full course of standard IMRT radiotherapy, thought to be, you know, kind of state-of-the-art treatment, and still had a PET-positive lesion with dreadful neck pain. And we treated her several years ago, and she's now 10, 15 years out. So my point is that these new techniques that of radio surgery are not like the radiotherapy that we have all come to really abhor and feel is almost ineffectual. Generally, if if you go to a, I'm always amused when I go to a tumor board. You know, it doesn't matter if it's if it's thoracics or GI or GU or nurse or, or you know, kind of brain tumors. The when new case comes gets put on the table. It's like like a pigs at a trough, you know. And so the first right away, the surgeon says, "Can I operate?" Okay, and if the surgeon says you can operate, that's the end of the story, surgery will be done. If the surgeon can't operate, then the medical oncologist says, well, I have this chemotherapy here, we should try this chemotherapy, then chemotherapy. And when nothing else works, then they turn to the radiation oncologist, can you help us? And now it is true that there's a lot of sort of salvage protocols for oncologists, and I'm, I'm really exaggerating to make the point, but radiation, radiation therapy has really been the fair-haired stepchild over the years, and I think that's changed. So I alluded to the fact that forever we did these four R's. The, and this date, for some of you want to know where the four R's came from, they came from a post-Marie Curie experience inside France where it was some way serendipitously noted that when you irradiate a, a ram's testicles, you can sterilize the ram. And that's a desirable thing under many circumstances. I guess you don't want rams to be too horny or something like that. But anyway, they would irradiate rams' testicles. But they also found out that if you gave the rams, if you gave the radio, you disagree, or I don't know, maybe you know more about rams than I do. See? <laughs> but, but they also came to realize that if you gave this radiation all in one big shot, their balls fell off. And it was really ugly. So, but if you gave it slowly over several days, you actually had a mild skin reaction and you sterilized the animal without any skin damage. And so this was the foundation of modern radiotherapy, the idea of fractionation, delivering small doses over consecutive days to allow normal tissue repair. But to administer that gradual radiation meant that you had to also gradually radiate the tumor. And that led to, I think, the great ineffectiveness of, the, of most radiotherapy for modern radio, uh, for uh, most solid malignancies. Well, long radio surgery world, we now have the technology to just hit the tumor. We don't need to worry about skin, skin dose. And so that's why today the most common dose we use in radio surgery for spine is for, for spinal malignancies is 24 gray in a single fraction. And so that's a very different world from the traditions of delivering 30 or 40 gray over the span of four weeks. And it is probably at least an order of magnitude change in the efficacy. So we can sculpt the radiation using these techniques, hitting just the target of interest. This is kind of a, a variant product. I actually would treat this in, over, over a single day, but many people have chosen to sometimes treat over a few consecutive days, which is a bad habit. I started with the CyberKnife many years ago, and now some people, I think, resort to these ex more extended fractionations out of fear that they're going to damage the spinal cord if they're too aggressive. But the actual risk of spinal injury in the setting of radio surgery is really vanishingly small. We did a study on you know, this now dates back seven or eight years, and we pooled close to 1,500 patients from UPMC and Stanford. And in our, this is the earliest era of, of spinal radio surgery. And in these 1,500 patients, we found six cases of spinal cord injury. So the, the overall risk is you know, less than about a half a percent. And that is the earliest day when we didn't know squat. So my point, this is a safe procedure, even when administered relatively aggressively. Um, so it's important to you know, know that sometimes lesions can you know, skip lesions. Even complex cases can now be managed up and down the spinal cord with modern radiosurgical techniques. Now, it's been pointed out that, well, sometimes the insurers don't pay. Well, you know, I think 
more often than not, that's laziness because we don't push hard enough. If you actually, the actual inputs, the actual technical inputs and manpower inputs to radio surgery are as little or fewer than, than modern radiotherapy. So the, it is, radio surgery has within it the intrinsic ability to, to lower healthcare costs and deliver a better outcome. And increasingly insurers realize that, and when they don't realize it, it's often because the, the local medical team just doesn't want to inform these insurers of, of how the world's changed. And it, it does frustrate me because it really is a collective effort that is going to change this whole reimbursement scheme. And, and reimbursement, as you all know, it's, it's, it has nothing to do with reality. It's a political agenda. And, uh, and, and that's very much true in the radiation world. So when, uh, radio surgery is a tool when you don't have significant instability or you know, significant neurologic compression where radio surgery should be the treatment of choice. It should be just the fact that it should be available and, and, and readily available in every major spinal oncology program. And I'm showing you just kind of a sundry cases. Now, those other cases, and occasionally you'll, you'll actually have a long-term survival of cure. And there was a paper just today in, in, uh, in, in the Journal of Neurosurgery where they talked, they actually showcased out of, it was MD Anderson where there was, what, uh, 70, 80 kind of long-term survivors. I mean, you can talk about it later. So people living five, six, seven years after, after aggressive radiosurgical treatment of their spinal met. But sometimes that's just totally unimaginable. And here's a case of a poorly managed chordoma, because I want to showcase even the most radio-resistant tumors have a role in treatment of radiosurgery. At this case, the this kid had poor poor kid from Canada who actually was operated up the road here by one of your uh, competitors, and um, had this uh, local cervical recurrence in his neck. Had had full course of radiotherapy. Had had three operations on his poor neck. Underwent this big stabilization procedure. Had despite all this, just kind of ongoing progressive disease. Yet we were able to get more than a year and a half of palliation for this kid which I thought was pretty, he came from Labrador and was just excited to be off in his, his uh, snowmobile. But you, you know, chordoma is such a complex disease and it's no way is radiosurgery an answer, but it can be in selective cases, even this badass tumor like, like chordoma. There is a tool, you know, radiosurgery is a, a, a reasonable tool to manage some and palliate some patients. Now, in those patients who undergo an aggressive, localized, unblocked resection, I think radiosurgery is as a, with photon beams, is every bit as effective a treatment as proton. Although the guy from MD Anderson may want to, he may believe, Dr. Ryan's, they may say otherwise at MD Anderson, but I think the, the evidence suggests that even in that case, photon beams are, can replace what you can do with protons. So over the last generated last seven, 10 years, we've changed the uh, radiosurgical guidelines. Today, really it's become pretty much cookie cutter. Give us 24 gray in a single fraction, get this patient in and out of hospital very quickly, and generally the outcomes have been extremely rewarding. This is just in terms of publications, there's a growing body of knowledge to support everything I'm saying to bury you in the details is probably not productive, but as long as there isn't significant spinal instability, radiosurgery should be, I think, the treatment of choice. Now, is there a risk of fracture? There certainly is. But I don't, you know, to some extent, we can never predict exactly who is going to fracture. And if they do fracture, I think they can be managed after the fact. And I, and in my personal experience, the, the risk of fracture is relatively small, yet I read much more about it in the literature than I actually experience it in my own, have experienced my own clinical practice. And if perhaps you can comment on this yourself, Lawrence, later. So, um, now sometimes, you know, obviously radio surgery has its limitations. It's best for smaller lesions when you have, you know, massive, you know, kind of lesions inside comp compassing the spinal canal or significant stability. It's clear that, you know, radio surgery is not the option and you, we need, we need all the exquisite technical surgical procedures that you're hearing about today. Sometimes we can cure patients. And this report that I just read is an example of, of, if not cure, near cure of patients who are now out five, six, seven years.
But oftentimes it's just a matter of palliation and there's nothing I think is gratifying is to be able to palliate a patient so simply. This is a single outpatient procedure for the most part. Patients feel well both before and after and uh, they get about their life oftentimes life that are gonna be diminished or shortened because of the metastatic condition. And it is economized cheap. I mean, the cost of radio surgery probably is, is no more than the typical spinal implant for, or half the cost of a spinal implant that goes on with some of the big womps we're seeing today. So um, it's outpatient, you can palliate axial pain and neurologic symptoms very quickly. Uh, it's cost effective and the overall risk is really modest and there's I think patients really out of the gate, I think instead of radi radiation being the last option for most patients with spinal, it should just instantaneously, the first option to pop to mind with in the setting of a spinal neoplasm is radio surgery. And only radio surgery, not that radiotherapy stuff. So um, can you deliver the same curative outcome you can with surgical resection. Now, Roy Patchell, I thought would be here, and he did this seminal article about how um, resection is such a superior procedure uh, to standard radiotherapy. I think the arguments can be made now in this day and age with modern radiosurgical techniques that, that radiosurgery can supplant almost anything that surgery can do, surgical resection can do, except for provide things like spinal stability or instantaneous compression, which is really, or, or, or to obtain tissue, which in some cases may not have been obtained through a prior biopsy. So um, think of radiosurgery, keep, you know, even though it's not sexy, remind yourself that it should be, at least in this man's humble opinion, it should be the first course of action for the vast majority of patients who present with spinal pathology, neoplastic pathology. Now, we talked, the, yes, three quarters of the work that we do at Stanford is, is involves malignant tumors, mostly metastatic, but there's certainly a role in treating benign lesions, something that's been a specific interest for me over the years. And uh, I had a reasonable size practice and things like um, uh, NF2 and, and uh, VHL. And so in these patients where you get you know, tumors over years and years and years. It's, it's nice to not have to, again, whittle away a little bit of spine here, a little bit of spine there, and leave these people, I think, much more functionally, and achieve the same clinical outcome. You set the same sort of radiographic and clinical outcomes with spinal schwannomas that we get with acoustic neuromas. And in this day and age, arguably, the treatment of choice for most acoustic neuromas or vestibular schwannomas is radiosurgery. It is not open surgery, it is radiosurgery. So this is a, a particular saving grace for patients who get multiple tumors over years. Also meningiomas, almost all benign lesions can be viewed in very much the same way in the brain and in the spinal cord, managed with minimal Morbidity in and out of the hospital. We've you know literally have patients ride their bicycle home after their spinal radio surgery, which is hard to ever say about open surgery. So um, now even in big tumors, we sometimes here's a, an enormous tumor, but an elderly patient. I, yes, she was a, a 30 year old woman. By all means, we take this out surgically, but you can even in this case palliate. This, a large lesion in an elderly woman for whom a big operation probably is not warranted. So there are a now a, a many dozens of papers on the treatment of benign tumors with radiosurgery. And I would suggest every patient should at least have this considered. Any patient who shows up with a benign tumor should at least have this considered in the process of reviewing their various different treatment options, especially in the setting of NF2. Now, there's a concern about secondary malignancy with, with some of the, um, the genetically proclive, those who have genetic proclivities towards benign tumors like NF2. But to date, the evidence drawing a, any direct evidence suggesting that there is a, a, uh, a greater risk of malignant degeneration has not yet been proven. So, um, so who should not get radiosurgery? Well, when you, in a benign tumor, is when you have significant spinal cord compression, um, no matter how much a patient begs you, um, they need real, a real operation, cold steel. And here's an example where this patient begged me not to operate, 
patient did have a, a mild spasticity coming in, and then a year later had lots of spasticity, and I took the tumor out. But the point is, if you are clinically symptomatic and neuro with neurologic spinal cord compression um, and a benign tumor, I feel strongly that just go to surgery. You're not going to be able to sort of buy enough time with radio surgery to obviate an open operation. So um, we've done, we use radio surgery aggressively for spine tumors, hair even in a 12 year old with NF2. So this is, out of my experience, you can achieve the long-term clinical, the same long-term, the same long-term clinical outcomes you can with open surgery, but without a lot of the morbidity as well. Treat small, big, even this small. Here in case of a tumor, small as five millimeters inside the spinal cord. And this is not so much a testament to what we can do oncologically, but just to the sheer accuracy of what we're doing nowadays. It's not your, it's not your father's radiotherapy, or grandfather's, or great-great-grandfather's. So um, we feel that any small neoplasm, benign or malignant, inside the spinal axis, inside the spinal cord, even things like, rarely, like a pendymoma, have a radiosurgical option in many situations. And it is at least, not saying it's, it, it, it should, these kind of therapies need to be considered and not dismissed out of hand because we are quote unquote surgeons. Um, which, so um, as Lars Luxell said, hey, I'm a, f wherever you have a, uh, wherever you have a fool with a tool, you'll always be a fool. And so there are things that have, and personally, I've personally done have been stupid or not worked out well. There have been cases where we've induced more, uh, um, sp uh, radiation induced myelopathy. Here's a case in point of a, a woman who multiple times had this meningioma resected. And after my particular treatment, I left her with a spinal myelopathy. Not a severe one, but it's still a modest one. Yes, we do stupid things, and you can see the high signal inside the spinal cord. But this is a very, very, very rare event. As I said, less than half percent risk. We could, just to show you the extent to how aggressive we can be, here's a series of spinal cord AVMs that is a particular interest of mine. And it's not that it's directly relevant to the immediate subject matter today, but shows you how aggressive we can be in and around the most delicate of all structures in the body, the spinal cord. And we can both target and irradiate with great precision a spectrum of different AVMs up and down the spinal cord and get this kind of involution that you see here. Most of the time now, complete obliteration. And you can achieve this, you know, great radiographic and clinical responses. So um, most of the, and one of the most telling things is that we've been able to, in this very rare but devastating disease that generally tends to occur in late adolescence, early 20s, uh, where the inevitable progression will be quadriplegia or paraplegia, we've been able to totally remove the risk of rehemorrhage, which is the first time that's ever been shown with this condition. And this is a paper that was just recently published. The radiation, interestingly, is now being used in some benign diseases. We've done some series of patients with rhizotomy, facet rhizotomy. Peter Gersten is now exploring this, and I think you're gonna hear a lot more from Peter's group about treating benign disease both via rhizotomy and also the uh, uh, dorsal root ganglion, partial lesions. He's doing the work right now in animals, and he's about to start a, some work in, in humans. So I think that the idea that radiation is just a tool for horrible cancers, you need to re reset, your, reset your way of thinking. In fact, we're even playing with radio surgery now in the heart to try to treat atrial fibrillation, and it's working very, very well. So there's an example of how nothing that you thought you'd understood about radiation is gonna be true as we go forward in the future. Um, again, this is more of Peter's work talking about how he plans to treat a, a range of different benign conditions with radio surgery. So here I tell you the story, I stand up, and oh, it's, stuff is so wonderful, you know? So, if it's so wonderful, you know, kind of, why does neurosurgeon so unexcited by it? Why is it kind of the procedure that gets stuck in the basement? Well, it kind of frustrates me and disappoints me, but uh, I'm going to keep talking. I think there's too much of surgeons, I think oftentimes are not forward 
future looking. We're so proud of our, our history. We're so proud of the fact that we once did, you know, amputations in, in 10 seconds and we could once do appendectomies in 15, 20 seconds. And that was what made you professor of, of surgery once upon a time at Mass General Hospital, you know. War, John Warren's Collins could do an appendectomy in 20 seconds. Um, you know what? Surgery is going to change. And to be relevant, we're going to have to embrace new ways of thinking about who we are and how we work. I think it is a big problem with radio surgery that reimbursement kind of sucks. One of the beauties of open spine surgery is the reimbursement is blissful. And I do, I do, I'm very envious, very covetous of what is accomplished by in the open spine surgical community. The logistics are awkward because we as neurosurgeons have to work with our colleagues in radiation oncology. And sometimes, you know, the, the lion is accountable to the, to the uh, impala. And that, that's just not how the universe is supposed to be organized. But regardless, if you put the patient at the center of your, of your objectives, I think you can come to appreciate just how powerful a tool um, radio surgery is. So, um, you know, kind of as a parting shot, I mean, we as a discipline, surgery is a discipline, neurosurgery is a discipline, is inevitably gonna change. And yes, once upon a time, the guy who chipped a hole in the skull or had the sharpest knife because you're a barber was the surgeon in the community. But we are not gonna be, we can't think about ourselves in the same way looking forward, maybe not in the next five or 10 years, but in the next generation or two, we will be asked to think differently about who we are and how we work and how we achieve our means. In fact, I think biologic agents are gonna be dovetailed very nicely with what we do with radio surgery. So what Dr. Brown was saying, I think, yes, uh, I think we're understanding both uh, cancer at a exquisite genetic level, but that means we're gonna also have opportunities to manipulate radiation using these biological agents. And so the treatments are gonna get more and more complex. And maybe there'll be a combination in the future of non-invasive procedures like high intensity focus ultrasound, which you have here, and radio surgery, and micro bubbles. And so what we're talking about is gonna be complex procedures that in the future could be every bit akin to what we do is the complex procedures that we do in the operating room, but these will be non-invasive and I think better for our patients. So um, I've got only a last couple slides because I need to sell something. Dr. Chapman did a beautiful job of selling Curious and so I, I thank him. But just one last reminder, this is actually to the best of my knowledge, the first patient who ever had uh, spinal radio surgery. And she was treated by me in 1991. And yes, it was a kludge, you know, she had a spinal, I think it was C3, uh, C3 uh, melanoma spine met, and a metastatic disease. And, um, and uh, we couldn't, you know, ordinarily in those days, she'd get standard radiotherapy and everyone, and everyone knows radiotherapy really doesn't work for melanoma, but it's done widely anyway, because we have nothing else. And that shows you the futility of some radiotherapy. So we tried to do radio surgery on her. And we did this kind of elaborate construct you did there using kind of a bastardized technique that we were currently using. And, and actually she had a reasonable radiographic and clinical response. I wouldn't say it was a home run, but over we followed her for five or six months and we were impressed enough that we wrote this up as a case report. <coughs> Wanted to show this was a cool new idea. We thought that we had accomplished. And uh, submitted it to all the big leading neurosurgery journals and all said, no, 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 no. Who would ever do radiosurgery in the spine? Okay, we won't publish it. So I never did publish it, but it kind of stuck in my craw that my best effort to kind of report something I thought was interesting never really went anywhere. And so that's kind of why I want to emphasize once again, Curious really welcomes, welcomes the outliers. We welcome the contrarians. We welcome the, welcome the oddballs. We want to know what's worked and what doesn't work for you. And we really tried to, in the creating this journal, stripped away all the barriers that keep you from reporting something that really interests you and think you might interest someone else in the world. Because chances are there are people who will value, will benefit from your experience. So do check out Curious. We're now publishing about 50, 60 articles a month and uh, we'd welcome every more articles here from uh, Swedish and SSF. So thank you and I'll shut up. Great. <laughs>